With me as we turn to the gospel, reading from Mark in the first chapter, these words in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, reading down through verse 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the evil spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Before we look at this text, if you would just bow with me again in prayer. Oh God, you know that we are set in the midst of many grave dangers. Because of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand upright. Grant that your strength and protection may support us in all dangers and carry us through every temptation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, today's gospel sets us up for Wednesday night's study in the Ten Commandments. Jesus, as he enters into Capernaum, which became his home base throughout his Galilean ministry, as he comes into the town on a Sabbath day, where does he go? Immediately to the synagogue, to church. Goes to the place of worship. Throughout Mark's gospel, you see that word immediately over and over again. Uh, it, it becomes a, a trademark of the gospel that the responses of Jesus, the responses of other people, often at times, it is a call for immediacy. Jesus goes into the synagogue and he began teaching. When I was in seminary and, and went and visited the Holy Lands, I remember going to that place that is a synagogue right there at Capernaum, uh, probably the place where Jesus was at. And going in there as we uh, came into the synagogue, the way that you go in, the doors are on the west side, and you come in so you're always facing, the congregation is facing Jerusalem. Or it's kind of on the west and south, or north side, so that it looks towards Jerusalem. Because everywhere around Israel, that's the, the common thing is, uh, in worship is to face Jerusalem. You're looking towards Jerusalem. And so as the rabbi would be up there speaking, uh, the people are looking towards Jerusalem. In a sense, looking through the rabbi to hear God. And that's what is most important, is to hear, to see God and his presence. I remember not only walking in there, but then going up into that area of the synagogue and standing in that place where the rabbis would have stood and taught and preached. 
it's a humbling thought to think about what it means that God has given us the responsibility to proclaim the good news. Not only as pastors, but each and every one of us. And the song that we just heard her singing from the chapel is a word not only for seminary students, but a word for each and every one of us that God calls us to go tell it on the mountains. And to be humbled by those words. And often we think, well, I am not worthy to do that. And it's not us who does it. It's God who speaks. Remember that as people come in, they're looking towards Jerusalem. They're looking towards God to be the one who actually speaks. We're, we're conduits. Our role is to be a conduit, an open vessel that people can see through us. Um, there's a, a, a Facebook page or a post meme that keeps popping up. I see it. It says uh, something about... Um, being proud to be an American, and, and who, who will share this? Uh, you probably won't because you don't want to be called a racist. And, and I commented under there, I'm, more than that, I am, I am proud to be a Christian. Because it is because of Christ in my life that is how I regard people. And hopefully that when people see me, they see me as, an, as a conduit of what God projects toward people. That God loves people. God cares for people. Whether it's male or female. Whether it's black or white or green or yellow polka dots. Whether they're short, tall, fat, skinny, ugly, beautiful. That doesn't matter. And, and that our value is not on our material worth. It's not on our position in society. It's not on what we have or what we can do, our talents, our skills. Our value is that we are created by God in his image. And that each and every person is a child of God. Many lost children, but still nonetheless, children of God. We need to hear the truth, the word of God. So as Jesus comes into this place and he begins teaching to them, the people are astonished. Why? <coughs> Why were they astonished? Well, Jesus' is teaching, it says, was unlike the scribes. He taught as one who had authority. You see, the, the scribes as they taught would always preface whatever they said or follow everything that they said with and Moses said or because Rabbi so-and-so said. They never offered up something of themselves. It was always pointing back to someone else. And whoever could cite the most rabbis or cite the most those people, that was the authority, not the person but the sources that we're giving. In organizational theory, there are different ways in which authority is determined. It's determined by the source from which it gets its authority. So kings and queens have what is called an inherited authority. I don't know, we'll, we'll probably sometime, in, I'm, I'm expecting in my lifetime, we'll see it, uh, a new king in in England. It's just at some point in time here, um, she's got to finally say, "Okay, I'm too old." She, and she's probably waiting for somebody to abdicate so she can choose which one she wants to be. Um, but there'll be a new king. But that position of becoming king is inherited. It's inherited through birth. Not because the person is worthy to be king, but just because they're the next one in line. It's an inherited authority. Well, then there are presidents, legislators, chairpersons, judges. They have 
what is called a delegated authority. They don't have any real authority on their own. They only have it because of the position that they hold. It's delegated to them. They were elected to it, or they were appointed to it, and so they have a very controlled authority. Congress has no real authority. The president has no real authority. Judges have no real authority. I mean, there are judges out there that barely can read or don't know a lick of law, but because they get elected as mayor of their town, they become a judge. They become a justice of the peace. Not because they've studied or know anything, just out of position, they come into those that authority. And then there are professors, teachers, preachers, doctors, lawyers, that have what's regarded as an achieved authority because they've earned a certain degree, because they've studied so much and passed the classes and do that, so they have achieved a level of authority. And it's a level of authority depending on how much they know, how what they are able to do, how skillful they are. Did they graduate at the bottom of their class or did they graduate at the top of the class? Unfortunately, most of us, when we go to the doctor, don't ask which, where they graduated, or uh, we don't ask, teacher, where did you graduate in school? What, what level did you have? Or the professor, or, or even preachers. As I was talking to this lady yesterday, uh, she, she commented after we were talking for a while, she goes, you know, I like the way that you've answered my questions because you've answered the question and not just told me this is the way it is. That it's obvious that you've studied this, you know this, and, and you're, you're explaining the information, not just saying, well, you just got to believe it. This is the way it is. But, you know, those, those are an achieved authority. But... Any of us in those positions have to admit, I don't know everything that is to be known. And that every week I'm still reading, I'm still studying, trying to learn. And the more that we read God's word in the Bible, the more that we learn from it. There's no point in which we quit learning. I, I, I remember my dad telling me when he turned 70, he had been preaching since he was 20. So he had been preaching for 50 years. He had a, a bachelor's degree. He had a master of theology, uh, a master of, of, of divinity. Um, he had a PhD in Hebrew. He could stand up here with the Greek New Testament and you wouldn't know it, but he'd be reading from it and you would think he was reading from an English Bible. I mean, he just had that kind of command of the biblical language. And he said at 70 years old, he said, Bill, I have begun to understand preaching. <laughs> at 50 years old, you've been preaching for 50 years, or 70 years old, you've been preaching for 50 years, you, you, you have been a professor, you've been... What hope is there for me? <laughs> I mean, I'll never achieve those things. He said, not that I have figured it out preaching. He said, I have begun to figure out preaching. At 70 years old, he was saying, I've realized that I'm just scratching the surface. And that's the way it is for each and every one of us. The more that we read, the more that we study, the more that we engage in a relationship with God, we should never feel like, whoop, or as one parishioner that I had one time said, I don't understand why you keep telling us that we need to be reading the Bible. I read through it once. <laughs> and you got it all in one reading. Praise be to you. We don't. 
We're still seeking. We're still striving to do that. But Jesus comes, and as he's teaching, he doesn't cite. He doesn't say, and because Moses said. He doesn't say, because Rabbi so-and-so said. Jesus simply cites it. You see, all those other positions, whether it's an inherited authority, a delegated authority, or an achieved authority, the authority is outside of themselves. But Jesus stood before them, and it became very clear that he had an internal authority. They didn't quite know who he was, but they recognized that the authority was not outside of himself, but inside of himself. Not just because he spoke strongly and sternly, but something pervaded from the way that he spoke that they knew. He knew what he was talking about. And he had an eternal authority. When we think of those words that begin the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. And all things that were made were made through Him, and nothing that was made was not made through Him. When we think of the words from the writer to the Hebrews in the 12th chapter, as he says, we look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith. Faith comes from and is perfected by and perfected in Jesus Christ and him alone. There is an eternal authority his authority is his word. And his word is truth. Everything that he says, later on he tells his disciples, everything that I have said, everything that I have done, has been what my father told me to say. And what my father has told me to do. Even Jesus recognized that his authority came not just because he was the Son of God, but came through his Father. Not because he was born of flesh, but the divine was present in him and through him. And so Jesus could say to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through me, except through <coughs> Jesus Christ. They can't follow Buddha. They can't follow Hinduism. They can't follow Confucius, Confucianism. It's even confusion to say Confucianism. They can't follow any other religion of the world. They can't follow Islam. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. He is the truth. As they were hearing his words and saw the power of his words, the, the authority of his words, two things became evident. It says that immediately again, there appeared a man with an unclean spirit. And the truth of God confronts evil. It confronts sin. And so as he spoke, that evil spirit could not just sit there and listen to that. It felt a disquieting within itself. <coughs> it was disturbed. And it asked him, what do you hear? Are you here to destroy us? Are you here to destroy evil and sin? Is your purpose 
to not let us exist. I know who you are. You are the Holy One. You recognize. James in his epistle says that the demons believe in Christ and they shudder. They know who he is. They know that he is the Son of God. And this demon recognized that here stood the Holy One, the Son of God. And he says it in that way. He says, the Holy One. Not a Holy One, like a rabbi, but the One who is the One, the source of all holiness. The One and Only. You see, evil and sin does not have any power. Its only power is in delusion. In, in causing us to give it power. To believe it, to trust, to submit to it. To allow it to have positional authority in our lives. Not because it is an authority. not because It is not truth. It is falsehood. But it's only when we acquiesce to it. Only when we say, you know, that is a lie. That is not true. But, oh well. We'll just let it be. We'll just ignore it. We'll let it just go on and continue. And we see that so much in our culture today, right now, more than any other. And where we are being told by those who are in delegated authority, who have no real authority, only the authority that I give. Well, that, hold it, that's what a demon is. A demon has no authority, except the authority that I give it. Those who are taking a position and they're saying, oh, you need to believe this, you need to think this, you need to act this way. This is what our society, our culture is now saying is okay to do and to think and believe. And it's a lie. And what are we going to do? Are we just going to say, oh, well, I say anything against it on Facebook, I might get in Facebook jail. Maybe they'll ban me. There was a Christian professor just the other day who was banned from Facebook because he stood up to a position that our government is saying that we must believe and do. So they said, boop, you're off Facebook. Are we bold enough to say I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to all who believe for salvation or do we just say oh well we just gotta let it be Jesus spoke with an authority that confronted this demon. And the demon was unsettled because it knew that it was in the presence of the Holy One. And the dark side cannot exist in the light. The only way that the dark can exist in the light is to push it out and close the door. And that's what our culture is asking us to do. To push out the truth and to close our minds to what is true. That's closed-mindedness. Instead of opening our hearts and opening our lives and opening our minds to say, God, tell me your truth and let my life be true to who you are and what you represent. To speak the truth in love, in grace, 
seeking to bring redemption into people's lives. Not condemning, not tearing down, not hatred. But to say this is truth. And because it is true, I mean, all of us that have had children, we, we knew that the stove was hot. And so we told our children, go over and touch it and burn yourself. Right? <coughs> Didn't we tell our children to do that? Go over and send your hand good. Oh, I know that's a boiling kettle of hot water. Take it off and pour it down your belly. No. Oh, we knew that cars were running up and down the road. And we said, oh, why don't y'all go play in the middle of the road? No. Why didn't we do that? Because we love them. We want to protect them. And so we want to tell them what is good and true and helpful. That's why we tell them that, you know, donuts and sugar and all that stuff is the best thing to eat for breakfast, and lunch, and dinner. Just forget about the vegetables and the fruit and all that stuff. Just eat junk food, potato chips all day. No, we say, no, you've got to eat your other good things. You need some protein. You need these things. You need a healthy diet. Because we care about them. And so we have to speak the truth. Paul tells us in Ephesians in the 6th chapter, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is against that which stands contrary to the Word of God. And the Word of God has not become relevant and changed over time. What God has said is true is still true. Sociology and psychology can't change it. We can't make it to be true to fit what we would like. His word is true. It's one of the things we've been talking about in the words of endearment, the Ten Commandments. That God has given us these Ten Commands as the character of himself and the moral fabric that would keep us from sin. So these words need to be because God loves us in our lives he sets boundaries around us to direct us, to strengthen us. So that the word of God, as Jesus is speaking, it confronts. But it does more than confront. The power of God's word is that it cleanses unclean spirits. It will cast out the falsehood and gives freedom. It brings salvation. The reason to stand true and firm to the word of God is not to cast somebody down, but to lift them up. To show them the truth and the hope of what it means to be the people of God, to know and become the image of God. Later on in Mark's Gospel, in another case, as Jesus is casting out a demon, he says, the truth will set you free. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. When we give our hearts, our lives to Christ, it's not like, well, forgive me, Lord, for doing this. Oh, I get to go do it again next week, and I'll come back and ask. No, if we have truly believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, if we have asked him to be our Lord and Savior, then he is to set us free from those, to not continue 
to live under the captivity of our sins. True freedom is salvation. And it is only found in God himself. It cannot be found in social conditions, in political positions, or national entities. Our hope and life is dependent upon a relationship with God. But as Jesus, as he responds to this man with an unclean spirit, he doesn't give a formula or a technique that says, here, now you do it this way, and then you'll be able to do this too. He says, be silent and come out. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's synonymous to what he was saying there. It's how he led his message in, in verse 15 in this chapter. Repent and believe. Stop what you are doing, change the course of your life, and obey me. Follow me. Trust me. It's more than just quoting a verse of scripture or reading the word of God. It is an indwelling presence, a relationship with God. Later on in that case where Jesus was casting out the demon, the disciples asked, why couldn't we do it? Jesus had tasked them with going out and healing and casting out demons. In this case, came back and he said, why can't we do it? I mean, we've done the formula. In the name of Jesus, be gone. It wasn't a formula. Jesus tells them, this cannot be done without prayer. Without a deep, abiding, intimate relationship with God. Unless God is dwelling in us, that becomes the source of the authority of God. God dwelling in us. Not us. Not in how much we know. Not whether we've been teaching, preaching, reading, being a Christian for 50 years or more years. All that is good. But what matters is an ongoing, continuous relationship of hearing God and following God in every aspect of our life, 24-7, 365. Unfortunately, the people in this story are impressed with the deed, and they miss the most salient point in this whole story, the point that the demon made. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. It is only in recognizing that Jesus Christ is the Holy One and giving ourselves fully to what that means that we can discover that power within our own lives. You and I know the rest of the story. We know the whole truth of who Jesus reveals him as, himself as. We know that he eventually dies for our sins, that he is raised from the tomb for our sins, that he ascends back into his position as King of kings and Lord of lords of heaven, and he sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and through us. So the only question that comes in our life is, what will our response be? Are we waiting to see what all God does for us? Are we waiting to see the externals, the miracles? Or are we acknowledging and taking wholly those words? You are the Holy One of God. And I will follow you and obey you to the ends of the earth.
In doing that, we discover the authority and the power of God in and through us. Before Jesus left earth, in the end of Matthew's Gospel, as he gave the Great Commission, he tells them, I will be with you always. And the authority that I have is now your authority. Go, teach, proclaim, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For all authority is given to you. To know that authority in our life, though, we must fully and completely recognize him as the Holy One. Amy picked the right picture to put in the bulletin. On the inside of the bulletin, as we go to prayer, you'll see that picture come up again. Lord, have complete authority in my life. Have complete authority over every aspect of my life. For you are the Holy One of God. As we go to prayer this morning, I pray that we all make that as our prayer. Lord, have complete authority. If there is anything that you want to show me, anything that you want to do to me, anything you want to do with me, anywhere you want to take me, anything you want me to do, Lord, I'm at your beck and call. Be in me who you want me to be. If you'll stand and join with me as we pray, as we sing and go to prayer, join with us in this chorus. We fall down.
Dear Lord, we do lay our lives before you and proclaim that you are the Holy One of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. No. So Lord, we give you our lives that you might cleanse us from all that haunts us all that confuses us, all that keeps us from being who you want us to be in our lives. Lord, may you be seen in us and through us. May your presence be the hope the love and the joy, the glory of God for the building of your kingdom and the redemption of all people. Lord, guide and direct us in all that we do. Strengthen us, encourage us, that we might be worthy, that we might be your servants. Lord, we give you the praise and the thanks for your promise that you will never leave or forsake us. And that we can do and be all that you call us to be. So Lord, we have come and we have sung your praises. May we go and be your praise before all people. We have come and we have heard the words of truth. May all that we say and do be the testimony of your truth in our lives. We have come and been with the people of God. Let us go to all people, sharing your good news, that they too might know your loving grace. Guide and direct us. Go with us to do your work. Amen.